It's Irene Adrian Kalkhauser from University of Basel, and she will talk about advantages and challenges of environmental DNA assays in monitoring species distribution and abundance. Please. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. And uh, thanks for the invitation to come to a Baltic Sea Symposium as a definitely landlocked uh, person and from Switzerland. Um, but you'll see in a minute that uh, what I've been doing in the last years may be important to some of you. So my ma main challenge in the next few minutes will be uh, how to bring everyone on the same page, because I'm sure that some of you have tried themselves on environmental DNA assays, while others um, basically know that there is something called DNA. And what I hope there will be something interesting and new for everybody. So basically, I'll spend a few minutes telling you who I am, because um, I don't know anybody of you, so I assume you don't know me. And then I'll tell you what environmental DNA is and uh, what is known about it generally in the scientific world, and uh, what the two main approaches are to detect it, to detect it, the species-specific approaches and there are community approaches. Then I'll tell you something about the round Gobi case study, which is, I think, the work that I did that brought me here. And then finally, and that's important for you, what are the potentials and what are the limitations of such approaches in monitoring? I mean, we've heard before that uh, monitoring species and their interactions can be tricky. And part of this is because knowing like these, these numbers, these how abundant is a fish, they rely on catch data. And on the one hand, these are biased by what species are interesting for people. And on the other hand, they're biased by the catch gear is used and by the approaches used. But every species can be caught in the same place with the same gear. So just a quick look at myself. I'm actually a molecular biologist. If you give me a fish, I won't be able to tell what species it is until I've isolated its DNA. Um, well, that's exaggerated. I've, I, I can learn these kind of things too, but <laughs> um, I've done work on model species before and um, for my postdoc, I went into ecology and uh, started working at around Gobi. And especially I'm interested in how these species adapt um, and why they are so successful when they become invasive. So my research interests on round Gobi are detection methods, that's what you hear about today, but also biogeography and genetics, um, dispersal modes. In our group, we do lots of work on stakeholder participation. And um, my personal favorite is plasticity and adaptation. So you may check out what I'm doing on any of these topics if you're interested as well. So what's environmental DNA? Let's get into what I'm supposed to talk about. Every one of us and every organism leaves DNA traces in their environment as they live and as they, as they die, basically. So whatever piece... Uh, you take from the environment, even if, if it seems like containing organisms, it will contain DNA. And this is something that's familiar to all of you. I mean, all of you have been watching CSI or similar um, movies. Um, that's what pe people do when there's happening a crime. You go out and you look whether there's DNA of someone and that you can actually identify individuals based on their DNA. So identifying species is less of a hassle and much easier. Historically, um, environmental DNA analysis come, came from microbiology and came from the problem that although we know there's many, many microbes out there at any time, there's only very few that can be cultured because only very few actually like to grow on agar plates at 37 degrees in the incubator. But um, people realize that when they just look what DNA is out there, they can uh, find many more microbes just based on the traces of the DNA that they leave behind. So that's where the, the discipline of metagenomics was actually born. Well, today, many, many different fields use metagenomic approaches. One of them is, of course, biodiversity assessments. If you go to very extreme habitats, it's much easier usually um, to probe the DNA than to try to culture the microbes or organisms that you find there, for example, deep sea vents or something like this. It's used in agricultural research to determine the quality of a soil, to see which soils do better under which circumstances because of the microbial communities that are in there. For example, in the detergent industry, to find new enzymes that nobody has ever seen before, but are produced by microbes, but also for food web analysis. 
because, for example, you can take the gut of a fish, for example, and not try to identify what you see in there because it might have been digested, but just look at the DNA pieces that you find in there and see what kind of organisms have been preyed upon. So how does it work for fish? <coughs> I mean, fish, like any other organisms, lose, lose parts um, during their life. They use scales, they produce small larvae that die, that decompose, they decompose themselves, and of course they also leave feces, feces behind. And all these items, they contain cells, they contain DNA, and these can be um, found. And, and in, in reality, it's a very... From, from a molecular biologist's view, it's a very easy process. You collect some water, you concentrate the DNA, that's our everyday work. You amplify a fragment of interest that allows you to identify a species, and then you actually go to detect the product and to identify it. But then things are not that easy in practice, of course. There's two main methods that you can use, and um, I think people have to be more aware of these two different methods because they have very different um, applicabilities. One is a species-specific approach. So in any water sample that you take, you will find many different species and then many different pieces of DNA. And then you can choose to focus on one species, which is what we did. And then you detect just the species of interest in your sample and no other species. And then you can go and take samples from areas where you know that the species is there, where you know the species is not there as controls, and then you can probe lots of different places. Um, for example, in the Baltic Sea, and then you would find where you actually have the species or not. So, uh, yeah, this is the species-specific approach, and as you can already see, the answers are pr pretty straightforward. If you design the essay nicely, you have one answer a visual answer that you can actually assess very quickly. And then, of course, it would be very nice if you could detect all those species at the same time. Now, this has other challenges, because to sequence all of these pieces, you need to have higher funds of money for one single experiment, and if you don't get it right, you must be willing to lose that money in one go. And you have to do lots of database searches, so you have to have a bioinformatician around. And then all you get is um, kind of community compositions that also give you a false impression of quantitative measurements. Because um, just because a quarter of all sequences that you found were of one species, it doesn't mean that a quarter of all fish in these regions were from this species. And also, you'll al always have lots of data that you can't really assign to a species because the species is not yet in the database with the fragment that you chose. So, a different challenge. And if I have to sum it up, um, I would say that definitely community approaches have a much bigger scope. And this is nice for monitoring, and it's very attractive. It's a nice vision. In design and validation, I think the two are pretty much the same. But if it comes to implementation and interpretation, with community approaches, I guess very few people will be able to have the money around to do them, and also very few people will be able to interpret the data themselves. And definitely it will be never the managers who will be able to prepare the samples and also to interpret the data themselves. While species-specific approaches can be done by any environmental lab, and they can be very easily interpreted. So in terms of monitoring, um, I would adv um, advise caution. And if some people tell you that they will do community approaches and they will solve all your management problems with this, um, maybe ask them again what they think. So now I want to present you with a couple of uh, scientific findings over the last years about how variable eDNA amounts in the environment can be. Because people always ask about, can I, can I find out how many fish there are? And you might get a feeling over the next few slides why this is tricky. The release rates, how much DNA a fish releases into the environment, depend on the temperature. 
And, this is, and these are all lab experiments now, so very controlled conditions. And even then, these things vary. So you find that the warmer the water gets, the more copies of DNA get released from an individual. Okay, fine. Then juveniles release, of some species at least, the ones that have been tested, juveniles release much more DNA per individual, no, per biomass, but much less DNA per individual. Again, getting difficult with the amounts of fish, numbers of fish. Then uh, the decay rates um, are not always the same, so you have the same amount of DNA in the water, and if the sun shines on the water, the eDNA is gone in a few hours, and if there's no sun, the eDNA will stay around for a few days. It's something you can't control. And it's the same for salinity, pH, microbes present, and so on. And then um, we might think of water as something uniform, but clearly it is not. And it, uh, it's not if we think about DNA either. So you have very patchy distributions of DNA. This is a small pond, and they have been trying to monitor fish densities with conventional methods and with eDNA methods. And you find uh, that there are some places especially here, can you see that, here in the bottom, we get decent readings for environmental DNA. On the one hand, they are close, very close to each other, you get strong readings and there is nothing. And on the other hand, you get strong readings in places where there's not so many fish that can be caught. So, while the main message of the assay would be, yes, there is fish in this pond, you couldn't tell about individual spots. And then, of course, there's, um, there's things that prevent you from detecting environmental DNA, even if it's around. And a common example is humic acid that's released when leaves decay, and the more of it you have in the water, the less positive your assay will be, no matter how much DNA you have in there. Okay. So, um, now I want to show you how we tracked the round goby with an environmental DNA, environmental DNA assay. And the paper itself is published and it's open access, so any of you can look up the very details. And I'll just walk you through the steps it took. But first, I want to tell you a bit about the round goby. I mean, I guess most of you know the round goby. Who of you has seen a round goby before themselves? Okay, at least a few. So here you see a few pictures. It's a small fish and it's a biological invader. And here, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I want to. Um, substantiate what previous speakers have said. There are so many things in ecosystem management that you cannot predict. And invasive species are among them. And you might have a very nice model of your ecosystem, but then an, a species come in and turns everything upside down. And if you haven't worked on a precautionary principle before, you might be very bad off. So the round goby has invaded ecosystems in Europe and in the in Northern America in the last 20, 30 years. You have it all over the Baltic Sea, in regions that could not have been predicted. So the northern parts of the Baltic Sea are, in theory, much too cold for the round goby. The round goby doesn't care. It likes it there. And these are data from 2012, so I'm sure it's um, the coasts of Sweden are populated much more by now. And I brought a little video to show you how dense they actually get. Now this is um, footage that's been taken by the Swiss National TV, in sites that we told them. And you can see they, they're very curious. You put the camera into the water and they start coming around, they start looking. And this is a random site in the river. It wasn't chosen for high density at all. And I jump now to a later part of the video, which is even more impressive. Okay. They're a bit like underwater rabbits, they just hop around. So any of you working on benthic systems, they might want to have a look what happens. So you can see they, uh, they really occur in very high densities very quickly, uh, wherever, um, wherever they invade. And these are, 
in just another way of viewing this in a more quantitative way, this is catch data f reported by fishermen to the, to the local authorities in Switzerland. And um, we actually do have eel, <laughs> just answering that question. I don't know why the data doesn't go uh, all the way to the authorities, but we do have eel statistics. And you can see that uh, no matter how, what catch method to use, more than half of the fish you catch are round goby already. And this doesn't necessarily have to be bad. I mean, it's a modified system. It's a welcome prey to many species, but things change. And you can decide how you deal with that change, of course, but that's not part of, part of um, what I'm supposed to talk about. So, and of course, uh, water resources are very important in Switzerland, and the problem is that most of the waters in Switzerland are actually connected to the places that have already been invaded. So, uh, worst case scenario is that most of the very famous lakes of Switzerland will be full with round goby, and this will affect fisheries, of course. Problem is, classical fish detection methods don't work very well for the round goby, because they hide under stones. They first appear in harbors, because they're actually brought about by commercial shipping. And so electrofishing doesn't work well, they don't have a swim bladder. Yeah, you can't find, you only detect them when they're really abundant. And if you want to do any kind of management in sensitive areas, for example, you want to detect them early. So <coughs> we went to design specific primers, which was uh, something that I've heard uh, <laughs> oof from this corner. Um, but this is actually something I enjoy. <laughs> Um, so we found places where round goby is really different from native species, and we designed primers for that. And we made sure that these primers, we had round goby primers, big head goby primers, and pan goby primers for invasive gobies, that these would really only detect the species that we wanted and none of the native species. And we were very specific about Swiss species, species there, because we wanted to um, avoid any, yeah, we can't, produce a reagent. Generally, you can't produce a reagent that works everywhere perfectly. You have to design it for your system. We also had to design a, a water sampler for our system because, as you have noticed from the picture before, round goby sit on the bottom. It doesn't help to take a water sample from the top. So you have to go to the bottom and have a water sampler where you can really exchange bottles in a very clean way. And we optimized extraction protocol, sampling depth, PCR protocol, all kinds of things. And then applied it to a real world scenario and sampled many sites along the Rhine. And uh, yes, we can detect it from fresh water. So, um, our main lessons that we learned, I want to share them with you so that you can think about using this for your system or not using it for your system, adopting it or letting it be. The main, main, main lesson is really one size does not fit all. You will not be able to design a method that works for every situation and every fish species and every habitat. Um, you really have to design it for the species you're interested in. And this also applies to community approaches, because you have if you decide for community approaches that you take a boat and you take surface water samples, you'll miss all the bottom species and the other way around. You'll have to adapt it to your water chemistry and so on. And then again, water bodies are not uniform. So um, you might be able to sample more sites with this, but you'll also have to sample more sites. One of our experiences was really that um, we had uh, two sampling sites that were just 70 meters apart. That's a big water gate close to Basel, so commercial ships pass through this. It's a, it's a very modified habitat, and on the left and on the right side we took samples. And on one side we got super strong signals, and on the other side bar barely anything. So <coughs> you have to sample in very dense intervals if, if there's a species you cannot miss. Of course, if you just want to know in general whether it, something's around, that's fine. But if you, if you really want a very clear answer, you have to sample in dense intervals. But then again, it's the same with catch methods. I mean, you can never be sure that you miss something. And then, something that I've been uh, advocating a lot recently, environmental DNA assays are not quantitative. Because I showed you, 
the release rates, the decay rates, the dispersal rates, and also the detection efficiency, they all depend on the system you're actually analyzing. And you cannot, you just cannot control for all of these things at the same time. If you want to control for all of these things, you have to catch, have, have, have a local control um, of catches at the same time. And then why, why are you doing eDNA? I mean, then you don't have to do it. And maybe I want to leave that as a message a bit stronger. Because you can imagine that all of these different groups of fish, a cohort of juveniles, a single adult individual, a lot of adult individuals in the presence of something that inhibits eDNA detection, or a group of individuals that have a lower metabolic rate, for example, because the, it's, it's winter and it's colder. Um, they all will release the same amount of DNA. And then how do you tell how many fish there have been? You can't. You simply can't. So, and then let's take this, what has been designed for fresh water, back to the Baltic Sea. Um, what could be the main challenges for using the round goby assay and, and other kinds of eDNA assays in the Baltic Sea? I think it's a very useful method, and I think you should try to get it to work for species. You should be ready to invest a year or two of research, at least to have it running in a reliable way. Um, one of the main challenges will be that um, both the habitats and the water chemistry may require different methods. And there's lots of literature out there, and everybody uses different methods. It, it's just about try, being willing to try five to ten different approaches. And then the next thing is that um, what I've done was really focused on Swiss species, and you have lots of different other species. Um, I can't promise that the primaries I've designed won't cross-react with any of your species, but that's about getting the fish samples out and trying it out. <coughs> and then redesigning the primers. I'm sure there's many capable people to do that. And then, of course, um, you have a bit more challenging situation. You have lots of goby species in your waters that Switzerland doesn't have. And um, you'd have to make sure that you don't detect any native gobies with this assay. But, of course, that can be tested for. And generally, the challenges for environmental DNA assays, I think, I mean, it would be so nice if you could replace all these monitoring efforts and all these manpower efforts um, with just taking a glass of water to the lab. And this was one of the reasons we tried to design the assay for Switzerland, because the most expensive thing in Switzerland is manpower. You know, to get somebody to collect water is much cheaper than to get somebody, get five people with their electrofishing gear out and actually do the job for a day or two. Um, but uh, like conventional methods, it will work well for some species, it will not work well for other species, and you will not know before you've tested it. It might even work worse than traditional methods for some species. And something that um, I also think is important is that community approaches in particular, they might provide a false impression of quantitation again, because in the end you, you usually end up with with something like a, a pie chart, how many sequences can be associated with a certain species. And you all know how quickly these kind of data get transformed on the way from your desk to the slide of some management committee into numbers that are not true. So this might be a problem for community approaches, and you would have to be very careful how you communicate those. And then again, it's the same like for species-specific approaches. Um, wherever you take the sample, the answer might be different. And you would have to be sure that you either take lots of samples or that you design it for a species that you're interested in. All right. Um, at the end, I would like to advertise some of the other research we do in our lab, because I think there's many more things about the round goby that might be interesting to you, other than just uh, the detection methods. Um, we are working on stakeholder engagement, so for example, we've been um, getting work done on, on boating behavior, 
because the eggs of gobies, invasive gobies, can potentially be stuck to the underside of boats when they are actually moored in the sand somewhere. We've tried to find out um, how research and research and, and knowledge needs relate to each other. So, for example, we found that um, researchers like to do work on the impact of invasive species. That's easy, that's quantifiable, you can do monitoring before and after. But what people actually want is research on management options. And that's, again, something that uh, researchers don't really like to do, because it means that you have an opinion and that you actually project into the future and that uh, you say something about future management options that might be put into practice, and then if it's wrong, what happens? Oh, God, can't do that. So there's really a discrepancy between we, we researchers want what, what we dare to do and what's needed, and we should be a bit more bold. Then, um, yeah, we also have done some population genetics, and here um, we have clearly seen that shipping and genetic population structure overlap for invasive gobies. Well, this was the big head goby, it's a different species, but they have very similar behaviors. And you can be sure that wherever you have commercial shipping, wherever you have also small amounts of ballast water transported, you will get the round goby. <coughs> Within Basel, it's really, there's three ports. There's a cargo port, there's an oil port, and then there's a cargo port. And cargo ships come from Eastern Europe, they come through the Danube, they bring grains, for example. Oil ships come from the Netherlands, they bring oil, of course. And uh, the cargo ports and the oil ports, they have different population, populations genetically, because the ships come from different sources. So within a very short region, you can have very high genetic diversity, actually. So all these things that you have maybe have heard about um, the evolution of expanding populations, about margin effects, they don't really apply to invasive species. Because invasive species margins receive so much input from different sources. And of course, we also do genetics. And um, I have the round goby genome sequence last year so. If any of you is interested in these kind of resources, you're happy to contact me. Another thing we do is uh, concerned with uh, Arct Antarctic fish, with microplastic, um, with uh, cetaceans, and generally how sustainability in the aquatic environment can actually be made more feasible by integrating different science disciplines and different stakeholders. So with this, I'd like to conclude already. I'd like to extend special thanks to the CMAP, where I'm associated member. I don't know if there's any CMAP members here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's your turn to ask questions. Thank you very much, Gideon. Okay. Exciting talk and new techniques and possibilities. So, any questions? This uh, technique seems very feasible for crayfish, uh, a bottom dweller as well. Uh, we have a problem with uh, an invasive species from North America, and it's very hard to get it to, to really catch it. Uh, have you done anything on that? Well, we, do, we also do have invasive crayfish. Um, at the moment, it's monitored in Switzerland by using traps, um, which seems to work well, but um, it would be very easy to design a similar assay for crayfish. I mean, especially, especially for invasive species, it's comparatively easy because these have evolved along different lines in a different part of the world, so they're genetically quite distinct from native species, usually. Um, so monitoring invasive species is, I think, the easiest task and uh, get yourself a molecular biologist. <laughs> it shouldn't be difficult. <laughs> Any more questions? Some, something maybe about benthic organisms. Um, there are studies that have shown that the sediments are actually a very good source for environmental DNA as well, especially for bottom-dwelling species. Now, for species that have only been around for a short time, 
this hasn't been evaluated, because of course then there is, has been less time for the eDNA to penetrate the sediments. But um, there is lots of people working on soil environmental DNA as well, and on sediment environmental DNA, and these might be the best ones for crayfish actually. Any more questions? I was thinking about the precautional approach that we mm. also talked about earlier with the ecosystem-based management. Uh, how do you work, or how do, does the management in Switzerland work with, with that? So now you have methods to detect them, but... There's different approaches. Um, I would say, for the round goby, it's a, it's a recent problem. Switzerland is not the country that does fast decisions usually, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what's been around for some time um, is the thought to protect specific areas. Now, you can, a PhD student in our group is now just uh, submitting her paper on modeling population um, control and how you can get the population below the threshold for a crash for round goby taking into account what we know before. Now again, this is, this is lots of assumptions in these kind of studies, but it seems that if you hit hard and hit early, you can get a population below the threshold um, of, for survival in some regions. And of course, um, what we always try to advocate is, it's the same for diseases. If you have a disease outbreak, one thing is you try to get rid of it, and the other thing is you try to prevent its spread. So you try to get population, our view is to try to get the population as low as possible in any area that's connected to a vulnerable area, for example, just to, to also look at the pathways. And then um, there's, for example, a lake in Switzerland that's, ter that's um, supposed to stay neobiota-free, so without invasive species. And then there's all pathways are being managed that lead to that lake. And to, to what level it affects the rest of the ecosystem? Um, you mean how much round goby affect the ecosystem? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Big question. Um, if you're interested in that in a more detail, look up this what do we really know about the impacts paper, because the thing is it depends on the system, and you can't predict it which means try not to get it there in the first place, because there's no way you know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah, precautionary principle. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, hello. I was just wondering, how big water samples do you take? 500 ml. So um, there's, there's very different approaches to how much you take. There is, um, I think for crayfish monitoring actually, and also for other purposes, they have done, gone as low as 20 milliliters and then pooled them in citizen science approaches. We took 500 and then filtered that, and that was absolutely enough. And uh, yeah, I mean, this was a pilot study, so all we had was actually an electric bike and a trailer, so we were limited in our... <laughs> So we tried to get it low, but if you have um, bigger capacities, you could easily go a bit higher and sample more sites. So. Yeah, exactly. So um, you said you think it must be more successful in streams. Yeah, you can uh, in a lake you can miss a uh, population, but uh, if it's uh, a creek or or small crayfish water, maybe it's easier to get result. Well, in 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 streams, the stuff gets dilu diluted. So if you have a population in a certain place and you have fresh water running around running from the top, then of course you you will dilute the signal. Um, I mean, in the end, this uh, what we sampled um, was. Uh, um, close to the shore in very calm waters where we assumed there wasn't much disturbance, which means that we actually, in the end, got a very patchy picture <coughs> again. Because if you look at the, at the, at the bench, a river bench, then this is not actually flowing very fast and it's a very patchy habitat. And uh, this was our experience as well along a river. If you sample on the, on, 
on the river bench, um, you might have a negative signal downstream of a population just because the signal never arrives here. Um, so you have to think of it of a river as well as a patchy environment. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, any of you have tried environmental DNA assays before, because I have the feeling that everybody knows about them and very few people actually try. So I was curious. All right, thank you. Great. Okay, if no more questions, we want to thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. See, of some presence. Thank you very much, Adrian. <laughs> Adrian. Thank you. <laughs>